Shelley. Give me that good divot again, please, over. Roger, Shelley. One nine seven six five four, over. Yeah, I'm I was on board the helicopter, one of the crew. Yeah. He, okay. He's with the casualty over. Why don't you just shift your rucksack a wee bit? You can just help us a wee. Don't move too much, right? Well, the guy who we knew, the guy, the guy slipped down the slope, and he was he did something pretty serious to his arm. What we didn't expect was uh, uh, facial injuries. We put a we put a collar on him just uh, just to uh, caution. You know, this is uh, normal practice. And uh, what we're going to do now is. Uh, Get him, uh, get him sort of put him in the stretcher and uh, get him to hospital. How's the pain? Can you hand it a moment? Have you taken any stuff before? No. You haven't. Okay, all it is is in a gas, new brisk breathing, as normal. Take about eight or ten deep breaths of it, okay? Then start working. You feel your heart mind going a little bit. Okay, it's not. You never shaved this morning either. Terrible, my tail. Scottish mountains and you don't save in the morning, it's bad news. is right. okay, but there's a cut down on the back here. Hey, I got that a couple of days ago. No, yeah. not that deep one. All right. no. <laughs> I don't. I don't think so. Anyway, yeah. I've seen they have actual field dressings put on, put on by the Mount Rescue Boys on the on the forehead to make sure that the hemorrhage wasn't continuing because you can continue to lose a lot of blood from the scalp um, in a situation like this. We've got a chap uh, who's a student from Lindsay. In Glasgow, who fell on the Namors. He is aged 21 and he's coming round to the ward probably in about half an hour. Lacerations to his scalp, head injury, fracture of right medial malleolus, and multiple abrasions. I recall uh, walking down a slope, and the slope was uh, hard snow, and uh, at one point the snow went from hard snow to ice. So when I stood in the ice, my legs went away. I just went flying down the slope, uh, with no control. And uh, hit, then I remember hitting rocks, and that was it. When I hit the rocks, I, th I genuinely thought I was going to die. And then after the rocks, there was nothing until I woke up lying on my back. I'm glad to be alive. I tried to stand up, even though I fell over, I couldn't. Although you see things like this happening in the TV, the, the full sort of enormity of it doesn't really strike you until you're actually there. And to see someone's body being dashed against rocks at, you know, real speed is quite something. You know, it really does, uh, it shows you how, how, you know, your soft pink body can really be messed up very easily. I feel like the their importance can't really be put into words. It saved my life. Afternoon on Navis Radio. It's one of the 
reasons why the tour is comfortable at William is Ben Nevis, Britain's highest mountain. The special attraction today is the annual race up the Ben with 500 runners from all over Britain taking part. Well, it may be dry and sunny down here, but unbelievably it's freezing at the top. So the Lochaber Mountain Rescue Team will be on duty with a 40 strong team of volunteers giving up their Saturday. Yeah. 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 You're doing Nevis Link. We have existed for 30 years. We have a responsibility for Ben Nevis and the surrounding mountains if anybody gets into trouble. We are on call 24 hours a day and 365 days a year. There are about 50 of us. We live in and around Fort William and we do it all for nothing. Hopefully picking up any, any runners that are overdue. We're quite happy to come out, you know, we're up and down here all the time and uh, we're glad to contribute a wee bit to, to the race, help them out. The fact that the, there's so many runners in it, there, there might be an accident, so we'd be as well here anyway, as sitting at home and getting called out later on. Well, I'm going to the, between the 3,000, 3,500 feet mark, and uh, from that point upwards, that's where the trouble usually starts manifesting itself. Especially if this weather uh, turns a bit nastier than this, it's uh, reasonable at the present moment. But um, when we go back to a few years ago when uh, we had the incident with the uh, high number of casualties. The weather came in really cold and a bit of rain with it and it started dropping. And I was just beside some runners and he just flaked out right in front of us. So we managed to get him into a casualty bag and just at that another one dropped. He went in as well. And then we could see them higher up dropping. One or two you could handle. But when they start going down eight, ten, more than in fact, I think it was about eighteen that day. And in fact when we got them through into the hospital at the Belford, some of them were touch and go. If the team were there, they were dead. Today is not bad, but it's quite chilly. It's actually snowed on the summit a little bit today, just slightly. It doesn't bother you to come out on the hill on a day like this to monitor the race? No, love it. Good day out. Quickest way up, quickest way down, down the scree. The record is around 25, 34 seconds. It's a hell of a speed, yeah. yeah very hard. Uh, What's your fastest time up and down? Oh, it's faster than that. Yeah, yeah. faster than that, yeah. <laughs> One hour. <laughs> Five minutes in the chopper. <laughs> well, that's, that's when it's uh, near closing time, you know. <laughs> Ben Nevis, for the last 10 years, has killed 46 people more than the north face of the Eiger. Wakaba Mountain Rescue is the busiest team in Britain, with an average 50 to 60 call per annum, including 8 fatalities. If we look at the occupations of people who have accidents in the hill, it's quite an impressive list of professions. Architects, lieutenants, chemists, engineers, managers, lecturers, students, and top of the list, teachers. Our statistics show that 67% of the people we rescue are English. This is up at right four. Mountain rescue has its disadvantages because 16% of the accidents occur between nine o'clock and three o'clock on Monday to Friday when I'm trying to run a clinic. I like to think I'm available for a good percentage of the rescues, but I make up for it in other fashions such as organising lots of fundraising, doing the statistics and organising the annual booze up. Many years ago, in my days as an apprentice on snow and ice, I got blown off my feet in Marvin, which is a remote new mountain in Neudart. My friends dragged me off the mountain. Uh, it took 16 hours 
before I was rescued. I was taken to the Belford Hospital and appeared in all the tabloid press. A dentist escapes by skin of teeth and goes to hospital where his wife is the physician. I would not say the team were adrenaline junkies. They're middle-aged men, average age 48. They enjoy helping fellow human beings in distress, delivering help and skills. The average person seems to think that if the mountaineer who got into trouble should not be rescued, he should be left to his own devices for getting himself into these circumstances, which is a very ill-formed and ill-judged opinion. The costs of a press output tend to over-sensationalise it, make it very dramatic. Probably Sabakwa, 50 times more people get killed in mountaineering, five aside football, 500 times people, more people get injured playing that. And if you look at water sports, with about five or six hundred deaths per annum, these subjects want to be investigated, not mountaineering. We go up the glen at night, and I say three or four times a week, and we just jump in the lower falls off the bridge. We're working in Fort William in, the, in a climbing shop, which is handy. It is hard sometimes to say to somebody that you're not really ready for what you want to do. In the Ben Nevis situation, you do get a lot of people in asking, how's the path, you know, how wide is it, and is it very obvious? Well, I take a map, they need a compass. 99% of the population could walk up Ben Nevis on a summer's day. That's not a problem. But when the weather's bad or trying to do something a little bit more difficult, it's hard to put the person off and then explain the risks. started when I was at school. It was probably quite dangerous at that time because we didn't really know what we were doing, but then you progress through it, you get hooked into it, and then it just snowballs through the years. There's a local climbing wall in it, and you would train on that more or less every night, and I'd, I've done quite a bit of damage to my wrists from that. I just I feel that they're, they're very weak now. They've got a lot of uh, cracking and popping. There's a lot of, sort of scar tissue there. And my shoulders as well. I've hurt, I've hurt them between my back. So that's basically carelessness on my part um, through, through not really knowing what I was doing, pushing my body at an early age, but I still enjoy it. Well, I'm 24, so I'd say most of them are 30 to 50. I mean, that's probably more towards 50. There are a lot of older guys in the team. Um, that's not a bad thing. They have a lot of experience, and that's the most important thing, really. I think I'm the youngest in the first team four years in the reserves. It's like an apprenticeship, you work, you work your way up, you get to know people better, you get to know the, the system better, and then you just get promoted through it, and the more you go out. But obviously you get a, an adrenaline buzz, if you do something hard, you're pushing yourself all the time as well, it's quite important that you're actually physically pushing yourself. We always feel a bit wary if, if someone expresses a desire to join our team. Really. Some rescue teams, we get the impression that um, people are in it for perhaps the wrong reasons. And we're, we're climbers first and foremost, and we just happen to be rescuers as well. I, I lived in the area for the best part of eight years before I joined the rescue team, and that, and that sounds about right to me. You're not making rescuing your prime goal in life. Back into the new position and move it down to the end. My father was from South Wales, but um, the main reason I've ended up in Scotland is because I used to come up here on, on holiday climbing with a pal that I met at college in North Wales. I really loved the area. I thought the, the scenery was tremendous and the, the mountains were so much bigger than I've been used to in, in Wales. Um, I decided this is this is where I wanted to be. It's a superb mountain. It's a, a very complex mountain. And you can see them queuing up at the start of the Great Tower and they go out of sight. 
and uh, they pop out on the summit of the tower and queue up to cross the gap and then carry on along the ridge. I think the main thing is that you, you can appreciate why other people do it, so that when they get into to difficulties, you know, you're, you're behind them, you're not, not condemning them or uh, criticising them, you know why they do it and uh, you just want to be up there to help them get them down. I'm a builder, stonemason, you name it, I do it. Where I lived in uh, Derry, I was there at the, the time of you know, the Troubles. And we thought, well, maybe we should go a more peaceful place. So it was an opportunity to get my mountaineering done and a wee bit of peace and quiet. That, that's why we came to the, the Highlands of Scotland. Where I do most of my work is Alcan Aluminium Works. The water from the plant comes from Ben Nevis. So it's, the presence is there and you tend to be looking up at it all the time. So uh, a good day, you know, you're really just biting at the bit to get an excuse to rush up the hill. And the best excuse is rescues. Any person going up there without reading this here and they don't know about Ben Nevis, they're really, they're not giving themselves much of a chance. Looking at it just right away, we have got a good comprehensive weather forecast and good information like extensive hill fog. They mentioned you need to be careful with your navigation. Heavy showers later on, and cool seven degrees at the top. The only problem is 24 hours too late. Today is Sunday morning at nine o'clock, and the forecast was for Saturday the 26th. That was yesterday's forecast, and unfortunately, I think at least 300 people have gone up this track already today. People know it as the tourist path to the bend. A lot of it you're walking on bare rock with scree. You should go up there with the same approach a mountaineer would use. It doesn't really for running shoes and uh, light casual footwear. Nearly four and a half thousand feet and they're doing five miles up, five miles down. That's a mountaineering expedition. There's nothing tourist about it. Where, where do you come from in the country? In the country, Peterborough yes. in Cambridgeshire. London. From Japan. Wales. Southampton. Czech Republic. From Hertfordshire. If it's set here very windy, over here it should be, on conditions of very, oh, high winds, it will be very cold. Do you have adequate clothing? Well, I've had two kidney transplants. And uh, this is a an achievement for me because um, I've never really been fit. If it's saying heavy rain, do you have adequate waterproofs? We wanted to climb it, we wanted to for a while, and uh, we thought perhaps it's just before the bad weather sets in, we, you know, chance it. Poor visibility, can they navigate? Must be hard going for two little ones. It's hard going for me, I'm bigger. <laughs> <laughs> that information, it should be easily read, French, German and English and get a basic language that people can understand. Are you enjoying yourself? Oh, yes, it is. You've reached the summit of Ben Nevis. What does it feel like? It feels like a big grave. <laughs> this is supposed to be the, the hottest summer for 200 years, and I'm actually standing here frozen today. I'm wearing my full winter gear. These gloves, I can wear these in midwinter, even doing an ice climb on the North Base. That's what I'm wearing at the moment. Down below, six hours ago, we were standing at the youth hostel, and I just had uh, a light thermal police on and it was quite comfortable conditions. Up here, which is probably about nine degrees colder than sea level, people experience winter conditions. But we have already had snow a few hours ago here. If there wasn't our shower and it covered the path, that again can be a problem because most people come out today, they're following the track which you see. They are not navigating. And then, of course, you've got the full north face. If they go over that, they're falling vertically for about a thousand feet plus first, and then a steep scree after that. 
We have come 150 metres from the indicator. This is the most important point in navigating off the berm and for visibility. This 150 metres on the berm we walk, it's actually taking us very close to the north face. You would think that uh, that wasn't the way to go, but it actually is a safe way to go closer to the cliffs. If you look to the left, it looks more inviting and looks safer. But in actual fact, it takes you into Corioan and Five Fingers, which statistically is the most dangerous part on Ben Nevis. More people have been killed in Five Fingers than any other part of the Ben. Reports have been received that there has been an avalanche on number two galley on Ben Nevis. Early indications suggest that up to two climbers may be involved in the incident. Lochaba Mountain Rescue Team have been informed and a helicopter from RAF Lossiemouth is assisting. Any 999 call would go through to the police and they would then contact uh, Terry or myself. If we need further members of the team to assist, we will instigate a call out. A full team call out for number two Valley Buttress. Are you available? Right, right lads, the situation is we got a, a call via the CSE hat just before nine o'clock. There was an avalanche on number two Galley Ben Nevis. Five were caught in avalanche. Now, we understand they've all escaped injury bar one climber who was apparently sustained uh, a back injury. We don't know the severity of the injury, but we can't take any chances. Yes, uh, I've spoken to Terry Regarnard. He requests would the helicopter make its way to the West End car park. Where the car is at the moment, yeah, understand that visibility is okay up to that point. Possible. That's just above the CAC hat. We understand that it's, it's raining in that area at the moment. Obviously, further up, there's uh, hail and sleet. The winds are gusting between 30 and 40 miles per hour. The helicopter's been unable to fly. It's very near. We dropped to the halfway lock and we're now walking out the CIC hut. About a mile to walk to get to the hut where we're dropped. I'm just going to get the stretcher and that vacuum splint up to the two casualties just look at the, the bottom of the two belly buttons. Get, get them on the stretchers and just slide them down basically as far as we can and then carry. Hopefully if we get them here then we can get the helicopter back up but it's still depending on the weather really. The wind. Well, it was not anticipation, it was just on you instantly. And you thought, oh, I'm being avalanched. I'm a novice when it comes to winter climbing. I've been summer climbing before. And so it's my first ice climb and my first avalanche. And I have to decide whether it'll be my last ice climb and my last avalanche as well. Tell me, can you move your toes and all that sort of thing? Oh, yeah. We dug a huge trench out in the snow and we formed a wall. We got the stretcher ready, we got the vacuum matters ready, and the guy was attached to different gear in the tent. So we had to slice all these ropes and all the gear off. Where actually is your injury on your back? We don't know about. Once we got him on that, we took out the, the air from the mattress and it um, forms a rigid support all the way around the, the full length of his body. And uh, once we had him on that, we put the casualty bag around him to keep him warm. Come on, boys, we're coming. Come on. We had a rope on the stretcher and we're now just sliding the stretcher off down the slope. I think they're having a bit of difficulty seeing the best way down. We didn't come up a terribly good way. And we're trying to find a slightly easier way to, to take the stretcher on the way back. It's not a matter of coming straight down. They're having to wind their way down the hill. I think this is the gully here they're on about. And the team are wanting to keep over to this side here, where the ground is say, easier rather than drop right down into this. The top end of this gully, it's fairly steep. 
So they want to keep over to this way down and then it levels out here just the above where the hut is. How are you doing, Wayne old chap? Somebody come and teach us doing wet hand Can you load? Uh, I was to tell you, just the information, we may not be able to get a chopper up to you, so I presume you're going to carry him down from CSC, over. Uh, if you can't stretch it down, I'll probably take them uh, another couple of hours after CSC hurts. So you're looking at yeah. two or three hours for me. Good. Yeah, that's the door. Oh, that's the door. Uh, name is Link, Fort William Police. Go ahead, Ike. Well, the uh, door reckons uh, there'll be a top car park at roughly about four zero minutes. Over. Uh, Nevis Link, Port William Police. Uh, Roger, Alec, that's all received. I'll get in touch with uh, Ambulance Control. Hi. Yep, I'll get that to Kenny. Oh, okay. Good one. Right. Don't worry, you're not going to leave you. Yeah, it was terrifying. Because it was, um, at the time, it wasn't so much the, the knocks on the way down, but, um, for a few seconds I was I was buried. Funnily enough I felt quite jubilant when I came to a halt because I, I knew I sort of survived yeah, yeah. it. You know, I come out very lightly really. See if we come in. Fall away yeah. boys, keep it coming. Fall away. Yes, right. Okay. Yeah, okay. It's pretty good though. Some session is chosen. His fingers and that. But it's definitely the lumbar area. Big problem with the stretch, stretch tonight. We couldn't get the two handles out, and uh, it was really difficult manhandling it with just uh, tapes. The mud was quite thick in places. And there was just too much strain on it. It kept flopping over. The other problem was the wheel underneath. It was a bit screwy, and consequently it fell off and broke. So the guys had to attach ropes to stretcher and to give it a good tow, just like we did in the old days when they were building the pyramids. John was leading, fell off. Well, I think he got very close to the top and there's a slab avalanche right at the top, which obviously swept him away and me. I managed to um, raise some attention with my whistle and three people came up to help and we decided that we were closer to the top than the bottom and we would try to uh, climb the last bit to the top and get John off at the top. Um, unfortunately, uh, just as again, just as the new person David was getting to the top, it slab avalanche again. So we then flew down about 25, 30 metres past the other three people and dragged them down off the hill. So all five of us went for about 250 metre slide. Did you just stop for the weekend? You for oh the yeah, weekend? we arrived Friday night, Saturday morning. Where from? London. So, it's the only way to winter climb if you uh, live in London, isn't it? Well, try not to cut the stuff off, seeing as you've been out in it for six hours and you're not particularly shocked, we're not going to cut your clothes off, so... Okay, okay. okay we're just going to take you right over onto there, that's fine. Just the yeah, things. Yeah. Noel, how long have you been out in the mountain tonight? Seven hours. A report has been received from police at Abbey Moor that a party of climbers at Stanshorn Gully on Craig Maggie may be encountering difficulties. Distress signals were spotted by another climber and Lochaba Mountain Rescue Team are on their way to the scene of the incident. He's not worried about the wind and he can't see. That's what's up. He can't see. He's 
see with his eye vision for me. Machines are, they're not reliable uh, because of the weather, so we have to get the, keep the ball rolling. Uh, assume that we've got to carry out this risk ourselves without the use of the helicopter. But we've sent uh, two people up there that know this area at the back of their hand, and uh, at least that's the start. We can climb up and hopefully uh, retrieve the situation. It's cold, it's windy, and it's, uh, yeah, it's a bit of a challenge. We, we think the guys are still on the route and we're probably going to have to climb up to them along the ramp and see what's what. We're not quite sure whether they're just stuck and, and safe or whether, you know, one of them's been injured or what. We're going to have to climb up to them from below. It's not normally too difficult, but it depends on the condition of the snow just now. It takes us about two, two and a half hours to get up to the, the lock and there. Take it from there. Once we got over the top, got the wind coming straight into us it was it was strong yes um, I mean both Mark and I got blown over I've never been blown over before twice I went off the feet it was um it was interesting, it was, it was interesting yeah I couldn't get my hood up because it had frozen stiff if you took your gloves off for more than a minute they froze up and my, my goggles had broken I couldn't see I was on the end of a rope with Mark leading at the front with his goggles and I just following the rope um, this one eye completely closed up with snow. My eyebrows covered up. It was it was it was good up there. It was wild. Uh, Mick, this is Noel. Hey, hello. Uh, when the flow was on just now, it looked like uh, one possibility is to go up just a touch with these folk and then traverse uh, left into centre post. Over. Uh, it doesn't look like that for me. Yeah, but you can put another flare up if you want. For these two guys, it was a route which they were perfectly capable of completing, and there's no real way of knowing why they haven't managed to do that. And however blase you pretend to be, yes, you are concerned, of course. Well, at the moment, the casualties are your uh, furthest lights on the right, and two of our guys are, are roped up climbing to try and get to them. Hopefully, they'll just rope, put a rope onto them and just walk them down oh. to the, uh, the, the easy gully. But our uh, boys are checking the gully out for avalanches, check that it's all right. They're, they're from East Anglia, yeah, which sounds a, bit, a little bit incongruous in terms of mountain mountain provision. There aren't many down there, but they've got a... Yeah, one of them has, has lived and worked in the mountains before and has not been in East Anglia all his life. They're actually frightened of avalanches, that's why they're stuck where they are. If they were to come down, the easy way down, they'd possibly get avalanches, that's why they're, they're wanting roped into safe ground to avoid avalanche that's probably what the problem is here we've been for a walk in the hills today but we had to have the right gear on we had to know where we were going we had to know at one point uh, if it got too bad that we would have to turn back there is an inherent danger uh, but that isn't reckless uh, it's part of the activity. Well, yeah, it's been a long 24 hours now, I've got much sleep a day. It's, it's not too bad actually, I thought it would be a lot worse, but you've got that wee adrenaline rush going again, you know, it'll be later on tonight or tomorrow when you start to feel a bit tired. You'll be hoping the phone doesn't go again, you know. <laughs> tired, three hours sleep and two Jaffa cakes today. There's half of the guys who were up last night haven't been to a bed. Tomorrow morning will be a tale. Hope it's not a major clinic. <laughs> Delighted you back, really. It's all. <clears throat> Pleased to see you. You knew you'd been seen, didn't you? I wasn't absolutely certain what had happened. I, I knew torches had shone in our direction. I wasn't sure it was you two or the other two from earlier on. It was you, was it? It was. Yeah. And we tried to give you three flashes, which we thought you might un see as um, we were okay, rather than six, which you might have thought was... Uh... But you did six, didn't you? You did six. Well... I did three, and then I waited a good long time, and I did another three, but that was the problem. The team was superb, just found their way up the ground that we wouldn't, didn't reckon we could get down in the dark, they found their way up it without any trouble at all, of course, and <laughs> abbed us down the 60 foot, uh, they were very, 60 metre pitch. Very confident they could get you off, no worries on that, they were off the fly rockets. Yeah. 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 That's great. And you owe the RAF about £3,000. Oh, the helicopter. <laughs> <Fuel. man. laughs> they didn't come, did they? Wait, did you? Yeah. What happens tomorrow morning? Tomorrow? Back to work, my friend. What time do you start? 
Pete. Go ahead, John. January, February time, this time of year is when it can be pretty intrusive because usually at weekends you can't plan for anything. You're never quite sure when the phone's going to ring or there's going to be a call out and that could mean a couple of hours away from the house for Brian or a whole night. Well, the equipment takes over the house. Um, you end up with every cupboard, every nook and cranny, everywhere is full of mountaineering equipment. Basically, the person has a gap and it's gear that is going to keep me warm up there because if I'm cold, I'm not going to be able to rescue anybody. Washing the gear, drying the gear. I've got a big first aid kit, goggles, ice axe. Putting up with three pairs of boots full of newspaper sitting around the heater. A knife, survival bag. That's, that's a pain in the neck too. The old whistle, one of the most important things a lot. I keep that in my pocket. I tell you what I really love when I go on holiday is to go somewhere flat. It's all heavy gear, but it's essential. Although most of the time, if Brian has anything to do with it, we go on holiday where there are mountains. That's probably at least 50 pounds, and that's minimum. Uh, there's no way to avoid it. I think he'll be struggling up when he's about 75 years old. Take it easy, boys. A bit slower. I think most rescue teams, wherever they might be in Britain, are all going to be mainly boys' clubs. Reluctant to say the word chauvinistic, but um, I wouldn't say they're that far away from it. Right, you're just going to lower you another 10 foot or so, uh, Brian. We are going to try and do casualty management the same as would be done for a roadside accident. We are going to try and achieve the same standard on the side of a 100 foot crag. See, so the clothes, is, it's always the same problem, the clothes. Yeah. Adds a new dimension to spending them. Sean, this is Noel. Go ahead, Noel. It's uh, pretty slow for you, huh? Andy and Tony are making their way back up now. You need to combine the skills of a climber and someone who is uh, able to cope in dreadful conditions on the hills with some of the first aid techniques that, we're, that are, are actually being taught now amongst the teams. Sorry it took a while to get here. <laughs> no worries. It took us a while to get here. <laughs> <laughs> Your doctor here. So what's the story, Brian? Well, the story was originally the two people climbing. The second was just a minor injury, so we got them off. Uh, Andrew was unconscious, no uh, verbal yeah, pain, just on. unconscious completely. Right. On reflection, I think we should have had the stretcher right. down at the same time. I think it should be three people come down immediately. Yep. Right. So we're ready to load and go now. That's and to get Load and go. Right. Tom, this is now. Go ahead. You ready to hoist Shane, the casualty of myself, all right? It's just very awkward, Tony. <laughs> Manoeuvre someone for a stretcher in a situation like that. Yeah, that was the major problem down there. Look at the angle of his neck now. He probably would have been dead. Easy, boys. Easy, boys. Just nice and easy. Well, stop. <laughs> <laughs> you know what I mean? Yeah, I'm fine. Don't dare screw that up. <laughs> We're just adventure training out of Kinloch Leaving. And uh, we, we got as far around the ridge as we could. And obviously the snow kept us back, so we decided to, to hit, head for the lower ground. And the, uh, so we could make our way down, back down to the road where we were meeting another crew coming to pick us up. Yeah. The girl just tumbled down the side of the snow. She got caught on a, a sheet of ice and just tumbled down. She fell about 100 metres. Uh, as you see, she's injured her, her knee. 
we think there was only one ice axe and crampons and that was with one of the instructors but obviously if they've, they've made a mistake uh, the instructor just uh, underestimated the conditions and went a little bit further perhaps than they intended. The weather seemed to be too bad to get it through to the place where we wanted to go, so, so, really, so we were trying to find an alternative yeah, route. Yeah, supposed to lose height basically. So yeah, not, yeah, not the weather that was slow, so it was a problem because it was a over. So it was decided to go down, and we started going down, and then uh, it was getting a bit icy as well, so people started yeah, slipping. Yeah, like. some problems. Someone could have could have lost a life, and it's certainly something that we would uh, hope that, uh, particularly like the likes of the army, would be able to get round and make sure that everyone had the right equipment before they went out in the hills. You know why we're here? We want to discuss this press notice that the Scottish Affairs Committee have put out about mountain rescue. And what I did is I phoned up the secretary just to find out what one who the Scottish Affairs Committee are. Basically, they're a group of uh, MPs. Uh, what they do is they take. Uh, all the reports in and then they make recommendations to the government. We're obviously concerned about this proposal mm. to introduce compulsory insurance. Uh, I think it's a very sinister development really to even think about charging people. Uh, for one thing it could lead to all sorts of problems with the actual rescue because you may well find that people in order to avoid being charged would expect their friends or whatever to come and get them uh, out with you know the normal rescue team circles. People set fire to the houses and they expect fire engines there in, in minutes and they don't get charged for that. And there are a hell of a lot more fires than there are mountain accidents. I saw figures that last year somewhere there was something like 600 people died, died from drowning. 505. 505. <laughs> I beg your pardon. 505 from drowning and nobody bats an eyelid. Yachtsmen are rescued by the Coast Guard and RNLI and there was no charge for this service and no requirement to be insured. I think that's probably true. Half our rescues in the summer are tourists, or more of them. So, I mean, you can't expect them to have insurance. Other people we have rescued in the last six years include 21 people in a Ben race, one hang glider, several Duke of Edinburgh award groups, one canoeist, one person killed by a timber lorry, one sheep in 1991, <laughs> <laughs> one person drowned, in 1990, and one person with Ed Stewart doing a sort of Radio 1 roadshow. A lot of people don't know, they haven't thought about Mountain Rescue out, they don't realise that uh, we're doing this for nothing. The RAF teams are doing it for nothing. The helicopters basically, they're flying for, or it costs them fuel and pilots time, whatever, but if they weren't uh, out rescuing people, they'd be out flying over the North Sea somewhere just to get their flying hours in and get some practice. It's funny because the region obviously considers <coughs> mountain rescue alongside the other services. When when I when I asked because I worked for the region, when I asked them what the what the story was about going on a call out, they said you're considered in the same status as a part-time fireman or a part-time coast guard. Mm -hmm. You know, they, they they view the rescue services in those terms. Oh. Only they get paid. Yeah. Only they get paid. <laughs> <laughs> I recall um, two incidents on the Ben. One, one was in winter where a woman was um, killed in a small avalanche in an observatory gully. And there wasn't a mark on her, on her body at all, just that the rope had twisted around her neck and she'd actually broken her neck. It's very sad. The other people with her weren't hurt at all. And there was a young um, American student uh, out in summer, got separated from her companions, just walking up the the normal path to the summit and she ended up in, in Fifinger Gully and it must have been about the last possible part of the mountain she could have hurt herself on she'd um, presumably gone to the edge to look over this little crag it was only about 15 20 feet high and she must have just slipped on the heather on the on the edge and um, 
I actually found her when I came round the corner into the to the bed of the gully, and she was kneeling on the ground with her hands either side and her head in a sort of pool of water. Uh, I think she died from a, a fractured skull. But it's always sad when you find young folk like that dead on the hill. The information that we've just received is that uh, from people claiming on the Castle Ridge is that they heard cries for help uh, from the climbers and we're going up to basically try and find out what the problems are. It's fallen off the ridge and uh, we're not very sure how far down the gully is actually coming. So until we get up there and suss it out, we won't really know what the, what the score is. Fatalities always make me sad, I recall, probably coming round to about a hundred or so by now. When I saw this fella at first, um, he's in the same age bracket as my two sons, and uh, I could just feel the grief that the parents and relatives would be feeling, you know, it, when they're about the same as your own family, I think it makes it that wee bit worse that you just feel it that bit more. I don't think you come used to it. I think you just, you do just tend to shut down that wee bit, you know, you just put it to the back of your mind, do the job, come down, go for your pint and that's it, you know, you're away. But I don't think you ever forget it, you'll never, never get used to it, no. What we're seeing as we drove back, you know, here's a fella who three hours ago was saying, what a day for a route, and now he's dead, and it's, you know, it makes it really, it hits you. Mountaineers tend to get criticised. What the hell were they doing up there in the first place? If there was no risk attached to it, I don't suppose we would do it. It's the risk that makes it that bit more exciting. And unfortunately, it doesn't always pay off.